Hello and welcome to Path to Power with me, Matt Cooper. And me, Ivan Yates. Today we're going to be talking about a very good friend of Ivan's, the late Taoiseach John Bruton, who died this week. We're also going to talk a little bit about British politics and Fianna Fáil and Micheál Martin. That's all coming up in just a little while. And Ivan wants to talk a little bit about the convention selections as well for the European Parliament. But first, I want to talk to you and let's take a bit of time about talking about John Bruton, John Bruton as a statesman and Taoiseach. But did you maintain your friendship with him after he left politics and you left politics? Did you remain in touch? Yes. Uh, so he left politics in 04 and went to Washington. Uh, and uh, actually, I, I really re-engaged with him in 2020. So I knew after my family home court case and in in January 2020, I was going to leave Dublin, leave The Tonight Show, leave uh, News Talk. Uh, but I had a bit of time until July. Like basically, dear decided she was going to go and live in this lovely house in Enniscorthy. And I said, who's going to dress me and feed me and all that good stuff? So basically, I had to, no choice but to follow suit. So I picked out about 30, 40 people that I looked up to that were older than me, former secretary generals of departments, captains of industry, you know, the way you meet yeah. people in your life. And I rang John and, and I said, John, would you give me any advice? And from that moment on, uh, we actually had, had quite a high level of engagement. He had a 70th birthday party and it was quite select. It was about 20 people at in Dumboyne in his home six years ago. And I was honoured to be at that a very uh, nice uh, lunch. Uh, and so therefore, uh, we always maintained our friendship. So then I was at Ballinrobe Races and Dan Egan, who was director of Young Fine Gael back in the day and the Fine Gael press offices in the 80s, like dealing with backbenchers, he said, would you, did you talk to John lately? And I said, I spoke to him about six months ago. And he said, would you ever give him a ring? And so I need to say I rang him the next week. And I said, John, I said, uh, I hear you're not well. And he said, no, no, I'm better now. And all this kind of thing. And that went on in conversations and texts I had where, you know, maybe Richard, his brother, and Matt Dempsey, who is his best man, former Farmer's Journal, a good friend of mine, uh, had said, you no, know, he's not well. He's not well. And in a sort of ominous way, you know, the way people say yeah. uh, that they could be terminally ill. So, so I said, John... I said, I really want to go up to Dunboyne and have a pint with you. No, he said, that's out of the question. And like he, he was, I think because he deteriorated physically, he didn't want people to see him and, and so on. But right to the end, I remember I was going in at, at 8 a.m. to chair a, ga a gig, an all-day conference in the Croke Park. And out of the blue, he rang me. This was, say, November or something like that. I, I had 10 people around me and, you know, people pulling out of me. And I spoke to him for a few, I said, just got to take this call. And it actually was the last time I spoke to him. And, uh, but put it like this, um, he was philosophical, but like John was a force of nature. I'm sorry, can I just ask you, and we'll talk about his politics in a moment, but what sort of company was he like? OK, well, first of all, it depends on the circumstances. Like if it was Monday and Ferry House races and he was Taoiseach, he would be well into the red wine. He would be a bullion. The napkin would be tucked in under his top thing. And you'd hear the roar of like a donkey's bray. He from had the, some laugh. The, yes, he? exactly. The other side. It was a unique <laughs> laugh. So uh, like my most intense time with him was after the 92 election, which I can go into detail in, in with you. But like, I have seen him under the most acute pressure. Like, remember, for most of his time, when he was leader of the party from 1990 to the time he was Taoiseach, and after 97 to 2001, uh, he was 16% approval rating in the polls. The party was languishing. Uh, actually, when he left the leadership, the party was in opposition for 10 years and I decided to get out. But like, so so I, I don't want to pretend to you that his real resource, like he was warm, he was empathetic, he was the absolute opposite of a populist. If he felt something was right to do with economics or whatever, he didn't care what the consequences of the votes were. He was very principled and that would have fed into some of his religious Sorry, I, views. I, well, we'll get to the religion in a moment, but I, I was rereading his book, Faith and Politics, over, yes. the, over the last couple of days. And I saw he said when it comes to economics, he didn't believe he says in right wing or left wing, but he believed in common sense approach to economics. I'd say a lot of his critics would have disagreed with that. But in fairness to him, 
for after all the criticism he received about two failed budgets, one which was voted down back in 1981 and caused a general election, another one which the Labour Party wouldn't agree in 1987, which caused an election, which was then effectively implemented by Ray McSharry, who got all the praise for doing what John Bruton would have done had he been allowed to do so. Uh, but if you go forward, <coughs> excuse me, um, the government that you were part of wasn't a right-wing government because it took in Labour and Democratic left and it made one of the most far-reaching decisions to the benefit of the economy, which was the 12.5% corporation tax rate. Yes, and and but can I just go back to describe what John was like in the 80s? It wasn't just Dick Spring had difficulties. So Garrett uh, and, and, and Bruton had led this, introduced a whole raft of committees. So I was a government backbencher, you know, Three elections, Avril Doyle, Michael Darcy, youngest TD in the doll, really just a chap, right? So my first big break in politics was to be set up with this nondescript Oireachtas Committee chair of small businesses. So anyway, we, I, I got lots of resources outside of the doll, and we wrote reports and I kind of made it into something that it wasn't. But one of the things we did for the retail sector was to introduce a private member's bill, which I did for a ban on below cost selling. So I trotted off to meet him and he was Minister for Industry and Commerce. Well, you know, sorry, he was common sense, right? He was absolutely ideologically opposed to this. And it was absolutely to do with market forces and he was against interference. Now, as it happened, he was shuffled back into finance and Michael Noonan did it. And Albert Reynolds actually introduced an order for that because there were some items that were complete lost leaders and the suppliers of those things. I'm not making an issue of the thing, but like John. So when the leadership, so Garrett stepped down and I had made up my mind, I was going to make a huge political play to back the winner. As I said to Sean O'Rourke, whoever is led into the winner's enclosure, I'll be holding the head collar. <laughs> and, and I decided, so with Peter Barry, Alan Jukes and John Bruton. And I said, you know what? I'm going to back Jukes. All the cabinet, all the cabinet backed Peter Berry. And maybe it was the wrong decision, but John actually did very badly. He was a bad third. So why did you go for Alan Jukes ahead of John? Uh, first of all, uh, John was, I, I, I couldn't handle John. He was just so sort of stubborn and principled and so on. And he kind of was leading into the Cosgrave side of the party and I was very much the Garrett side of the party. Uh, I also felt he was more modern and I felt that Peter Barry was at that stage quite elderly and it was just a stopgap uh, and, and, and so on. So what happened was leadership, the leadership Dukes was a disaster. It was a disaster. Uh, culminating in the presidential election, that was 87, in 1990. So... They came, and I was loyal to the Dukes at the end, but they persuaded him to step down. There wasn't a contest. So I then had a kind of lukewarm, hands-off relationship. He kept me on the front bench. This is uh, with John Bruton yes, when with John succeeded Bruton. Alan. So then what happened was the 92 election came along. And I was kind of given enough rope to hang himself at this stage. And, and, and so basically what happened was, I said always the problems of the party much deeper than just the, I said if Brad Pitt was leading the party, we wouldn't be doing well. And that we had to get more identity and branding and all that kind of thing and reorganise the party and do, do various things. So what happened then was in 1992, it was another disaster. Uh, instead of it being expected that we'd win power, Labour swept the boards and Fine Gael lost 10 seats. He wasn't able to put a government together and there's a Fine Gael rule that every leader that isn't, you are not Taoiseach after the election, you must have a vote of confidence, a secret ballot vote. And he really struggled with this. And then what happened was he actually turned to me and it started to shore up his defences and we became intensely close. I suggest... Why? What, what, what changed your attitude Oh, I wanted to be him. in the cabinet. So I, I realised the Fine Gael... It was a calculation on your oh, part. Oh, no, sorry. No, sorry. You, the, the power is in the, in the eye of the beholder. You it know, wasn't power. shared ideological beliefs no, or anything no, like no, that. No, no, no. Just to, Sorry, I always knew, and, and, you know, people close to me knew, there were six cabinet seats if Fine Gael got into power. But sure, there could be 40 or 50 people in the parliamentary party. So you've got to be very tight with the leader. So then what <laughs> happened? Why are you laughing? Is this the cynical calculation no, of no, it all? No, 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 sorry. But no, but then what happened was, in, in things weren't improving. And, and, and so basically what happened was, one day at the front bench, uh, four people, members of the front bench, Alan Shatter, uh, Charlie Flanagan, uh, uh, they'll come to me, uh, resigned. 
and it was an absolute coup. With Michael Noonan, uh, no, 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 he was supporting it, but he yeah. wasn't. He wasn't one of of, of, of the four. Um, and and basically, uh, the situation uh, was that it 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 was a complete. Forgive the expression, shit show. It was an internecine battle for power because it now looked like you know Fine Gael might be in the next government and so on. And basically, I had said to him after what you need to do is you need a female leader. I suggest Nora Owen. She's Dublin. I went to him and said the party's finances. Deputy leader, presumably. Yes, deputy leader. Uh, I went to him and said uh, the party finances. Party owes a million. Michael Lowry raised a million for Semple Stadium. Get him. And I said the person who really will transformed the organisation as Phil Hogan. And it actually ironically became, they all became much closer to John Bruton as the years went by than I actually was. But at this pivotal moment of vulnerability and weakness, I was the closest person to him. Roy Dooney and Neil Malore were there as party parade professionals. So this, this, this was, we won the vote anyway. So he made me spokesman on finance. And basically then... Oh, then the polls didn't improve and we hit October 94. And he really, I, I knew I couldn't sustain the whole thing that the ground was going to go. And he really battled over the, the something to do with the AG and he went on the This Week programme in November and then we had the two by-election results and Dick Spring walked out. Well, I suppose it was more to do with the Harry Wheelahan affair. That's right, that's right, yeah. And Albert Reynolds and what he had told Dick Spring and the relationships broke down, lack of trust. And then to everybody's amazement, rather than having another general election, you were able to form a government, the first three-party coalition government, the Rainbow Coalition with Labour and Democratic Left, Despite a big reluctance on the part, particularly of Dick Spring, given his own experiences of having been in government with John Bruton during the 1980s. And it really struck me this week that the generosity of Dick Spring's tribute to John Bruton and pointing out that, yes, they found it difficult to get on in the 1980s, but that he saw a different John Bruton when he became Taoiseach. He was a different person. It strikes me that sometimes, you know, we looked to elect very strong opposition leaders who were great orators, who were able to, you know, score mm. whole, score points by punching away at the government of the day. He wasn't particularly good at that. He wasn't strong as a speaker in laying into the government of the day. He wasn't opportunistic. No, OK, but he then proved himself, to everyone's surprise, to be pragmatic, even pliable. As, yeah. so, as the Taoiseach. And I think you said this to me the other day on The Last Word as well, was that when he saw the opportunity, he said to you, we're not going to mess this up. <laughs> we are going to get this government together no matter what, what people think. No, so and, and he, he bent over backwards to no, accommodate and he actually and said to me, left. So, so I became Minister for Agriculture, which was responsible for implementing the recommendations of the Beef Tribunal Report. He said, I just want to say this to you. Said, do not have any rows with punches to Ross or Dick Spring. If they say jump, you say how I. Our job is to keep this government together, to keep them happy, to do what Albert didn't do. And you know what? Our strategy is if the government does well, we being the biggest party will be the biggest beneficiary. So there was absolute strategy behind and it. And the irony is, is that I was looking at this, I believe he was the only Finnegale leader who, as Taoiseach, managed to increase the number of Fine Gael seats in the subsequent election. In 1997, you increased your seats, but the reason you didn't get back into power and had to hand over to Bertie Ahern and the PDs was because Labour lost so many seats. But that Fine Gael's performance did improve under his watch. Yeah, and I, I was particularly because because I've been through the whole BSE thing. All the eight seats we gained were nearly in rural constituencies and the farming vote became very strong to us. And actually, I, I have to put my hand up here, Everyone now, both within the party and at that time, blamed me for the June election. Actually, Labour wanted a June election. But I said, look, uh, it's going to be a, a real slump in cattle prices in the autumn and I'm going to get it in the neck. And I've got rounds of subsidies from Rory Quinn and from Brussels and the money is running out. And it would suit me to go now personally. And so basically, uh, and, and the interesting story then was, just to tell you about the humanity of the man. So at this stage, I had sort of, 
Before I became minister, built up six betting shops and my head had been turned in the direction of business. Now, it was expected that uh, I would stand for the leadership of the party. So in 1997, uh, I said, John, let's go for lunch and let's review where we're at and, and so on. So I said, John, um, not only am I not going to be a threat to you looking over your shoulder as an alternative leader, uh, and he'd always be attuned to all that, uh, his radar be up. Uh, and I remember it was in, in Bagot Street and I said, I'm actually going to leave politics. And he, he said, look, will you make me one commitment that we'll try and put the rainbow together again once and if it doesn't work, then you can leave. So I said, John, I really don't want to be disingenuous about this, but I said, look, I kind of owe you and we'll do this. And so then we, we trotted along and 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 then... The first heave came, a DC out of the blue, Austin DC put down a motion in uh, 2000, in the autumn of 2000. And I was one of the tellers. And like it was treated like this, a maverick, a solo run. And I saw that about 26 people voted against him in what was a non-event. And I said, John, this, this is a bit perilous. So then what happened was in January 01, the big guns came for him. Michael Noonan, Jim Mitchell had actually a push with them, you know, in, in, in situ. And so I'd actually been selected for the convention in Wexford. And so Michael Noonan met me that night and he said, look, I see you playing. I have a senior role in all this. I said, Michael, actually, I'm going to announce I'm leaving politics tomorrow. And he he, he tried to persuade me not to. And I like, so I, I kind of felt... A deep admiration and respect for Michael Noonan, but I felt we would keep heaving until he was... This was really unpleasant stuff. Now, this was inter Nissan, you know, sort of colleagues fighting with each other. Okay, a couple of things I want to tease out with you. He didn't try and persuade you to stay in politics. He said, yeah, go off and do business. Because, again, and this is from reading his book, he had this belief in public service almost been second to a vocation that he never had his own ambitions in relation to the private sector. He saw himself... Oh, money. Yeah. But I suppose people would argue he came from a bit of money, so he had yes. a bit of comfort in old relation money. to that old money. And which, in some respects, gives you a degree of freedom to perhaps maybe be a better politician, even though he was scoffed at by many for being wealthy and the idea being, well, you wouldn't have put VAT in children's shoes if you came, didn't come from a very well-heeled background, so to speak. But did he not try and persuade you that forget about going into business and particularly the business of gambling <laughs> when you should be continuing your work as a public servant? No, he he, he felt, uh, I, I, think, I think the loss of the 97 election, although it wasn't a Fine Gael problem per se, as you rightly said, he, he actually felt it was doable. And, uh, but actually... I actually felt something different. The day I left politics, I said to people, Fine Gael are not going to be in power for 10 years. I am not going to waste my time on the opposition benches. Time is too valuable. I was now in my 40s. And so basically, um, and all the problems were deeper than John Bruton. As you said, our lowest vote ever was in 2002. Now, the other thing that's very interesting from that period as a minister, um, and we'll get to the North in a moment, but the divorce referendum in 1995 fascinates me because... I do saw some people saying during the week that this was the start of the liberalisation of Ireland. I disagree slightly in that I think that the previous government's decriminalisation of homosexuality with Maura Gagan Quinn as the relevant minister was probably the breakthrough moment of change. Mm -hmm. But the divorce referendum was incredibly significant in 1995 given that it had been defeated in 1986, the previous attempt to allow for a divorce to happen. And Famously, you mentioned uh, Liam Cosgrave back at the time in the 1970s voted against his government's own contraceptive legislation and became something of a laughing stock, but allowed his own religious faith to take precedence over serving the government and indeed you could say the state. Whereas John Bruton, despite the fact of being a very conservative Catholic with a very deeply held religious faith, once the government decided to go ahead, he campaigned enthusiastically and also made what may actually have been the decisive intervention on the Sunday before the vote when he went on the This Week programme, argued very strongly in favour of this is the way things are going and the way we should be going. And that may have actually secured it. Maybe it was the fact that he was a devout Catholic, which might have actually tipped the last few votes in way of allowing. What year towards. was that? 1995. Uh, okay, in 1985... 
I remember Michael O'Leary, who had been leader of the Labour Party. This is uh, not the Ryanair, Michael yeah, O'Leary. No, exactly, yeah. This is the original. A nice guy, a yeah. nice guy. And, and from Cork. And basically, he was leader of the Labour Party and he defected uh, to Fine Gael. Yeah. And he was made director of elections. And I remember having a 500 quid, in those days it was quid, bet with him in the Dáil lobby. I said, you know, this referendum is going to be defeated. And I was very much in favour of it. But people like John Bruton and that in the 80s were actually just not not really doing their bit to get it through. Remember this, Garrett was the originator of the species in terms of the constitutional crusade on all these issues. And really, really, uh, I mean, the saddest point for Garrett has been ambushed by SPs you see over the abortion, anti-abortion thing and so on. But basically, that was one of the reasons I didn't support Bruton was because he was an arch conservative well, so on he, those issues. He was actually, and this is relevant to his decision to support the divorce referendum, he believed in the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution in relation to abortion and he re-emerged in 2018. He gave another very late interview to Sean O'Rourke on the radio uh, the Friday before the referendum in which he strongly argued for the retention of Article 8 because he was very strongly anti-abortion. Mm. Those were his beliefs and I suspect this week on the radio when we've been looking for people to talk about him, some feminists who I would have expected to come on and maybe talk positively about him because of the divorce mm. referendum uh, passed on the opportunity and I suspect the reason they passed on the opportunity was because they were disappointed in his position in relation to the abortion referendum in 2018. And and, and you remember the um, right to travel and right to information yeah. and all of that. I was actually, you know, Nora and I would, Nora Owen and I would have been very close and all because we were right in the battering ram of all these votes and so on. And she said to me that her distinct memory was not when we were in government, that when those votes came up, he actually wasn't in favour of those changes. Yeah. And so, and I would say both him and Fanula, uh, and I, I, I noticed some tributes from senior bishops and so on. I, I would say religion was very important to him. And he was very sincere about it. And, uh, you know, you know, you know, someone like me, if it's if it's populist to be religious, I'll be religious. But if it's not populist, I'll go the other way. He was actually committed to the thing. So I actually think, so there's so many things we could do, but I would say this. I think his legacy is if you are interested in politics and you want to be a TD in terms of how to conduct yourself at constituency level, at, at national level, how to work on policy to get on the front bench, he is a role model for a parliamentarian. There's one other thing I want to bring up in his career um, and I know we're spending time with him but you know it's not every day that you have such a significant figure as a former Tisha who dies and he deserves to be discussed and assessed and that was his role in the North because Everyone remembers the Downing Street Declaration at the time with Albert Reynolds' Taoiseach and they remember the Good Friday Agreement with Bertie Ahern. But the framework document was very important as a stepping stone towards uh, the Good Friday Agreement. And that was agreed between John Bruton and John Major with Dick Spring, of course, been mm. absolutely essential to all of that as well. And there is... He was described in some quarters was a cause of an allegedly inadvertent slip of the tongue by Albert Reynolds in the Doyle when he described him as John Unionist. Mm. And this was seized upon by people who like to describe him as a West Brit. Mm. But there's a few things here. He was very strongly anti-violence. He did not believe Absolutely. that you could advance anything Billy in Fox. politics. Well, actually, so before I go into my day, tell us about Billy Fox, because well, well, there's a lot of people will not know of the death of Senator Billy Fox well, and well, what happened. You probably remember the details better than me. But I the, don't actually. Well, was he was killed young. by the UVF. Yeah. He was killed by the UVF. He was a, a, a Fine Gael senator and he was a close friend of John. No, I, I would actually say that I will give a, some credit to John. I give a lot of credit to the senior civil servants. I give a lot of credit to the Anglo-Irish Agreement and I give a lot of credit to Dick Spring. In fairness, can I say that uh, he was absolutely pathologically opposed to violence, as you say, and to Sinn Féin. Sorry, and yeah, because the he IRA, was, he was absolutely yeah. like he had uh, like to the point that he just it was an absolute principle. Where I think he did make a difference was when he became leader of the party. You become uh, involved in monthly meetings for every summit with the European People's Party, even though you're not Taoiseach. Yeah. He loved every minute. He used to write things about the constitution of Europe. He really passionately cared about that. Would be open on the question of neutrality, but he was an absolute Europhile. I want to come back to the North, though, because 
as I said, he he would believe the 1916 rising was wrong. He wanted John Redmond's Home Rule Bill to the parliamentary it. tradition. Yeah, that 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 would have gone through. I I mean, I don't know why he went on about it so much because he only made I think a rod for his own back because it allowed then people to batter him as not being a true Irishman and the rest of it. He really wouldn't care about that. Like that's why he was uh, unmanageable. And can I just add one yeah. other thing, which is a joke. You know, Richard made a great speech in the door. I don't know if you yes, heard it. Yes, I saw it. And, yes. uh, and uh, one of the things he said, John really believed every person counts. And this became a slogan for us in the early 90s. And this drove me Absolutely insane. What does, what does that mean? It is so bland. It's so, like, who you were, is every person? Sorry, you, you were talking about writer. branding. No, 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 but I'm saying there was the, there was a catch-all, catch-nothing. And I used to have these rows of them. John, you actually don't have a cutting edge in terms of what the party stands for. And and he's, he kept coming back to this every person. It drove me insane. Okay, but the final point on this is he wanted to reach out. And one of the things that, again, he got lambasted for was for welcoming Prince Charles in 1995 to Dublin Castle, state visit, state dinner. Wrongly, it has been attributed to him that he said it was the happiest day of his life, which he hadn't. If you actually listen back, as I did this week, to the audio, he said about just how significant it was and moving things on. All the people who are criticising him, well, and who said West Brit type stuff mm. like that, well, you know, afterwards, the Queen came in 2011, but... Various people from Sinn Féin have been shaking hands with royalty, have been, uh, Michelle O'Neill had Prince Charles come to the north Mm. after Queen Elizabeth died. She welcomed him. She went to his coronation. You know, she Mm. has expressed sympathy this week on the news that Charles has cancer. You wouldn't say that uh, Michelle O'Neill was uh, Michelle Unionist or anything like mm. that. He was just good manners and good neighbourliness and maybe he was ahead but, of his time but in relation actually, to that. Some of that stuff uh, he wore as a badge of honour. He knew that this was not, uh, you know, you know my thing, find out what the people want and give it to him. You know, he, he knew this was thing and so on. Can I tell you a final anecdote yeah. which will really just tell you about the loyalty and kindness of the man. So anyway, uh, I became Minister of Agriculture I had all these reforms, 20-year forestry programme, big horizon thing for exports, uh, and then all the different production output things and charter of rights for farmers. And I was I was the youngest ever, Mr. Vecco, and I was really wanting to make an impact. I was in before the cleaners at 6am. I worked, you know, through the time. So BSE came along uh, out of a clear blue sky. And basically, uh, he said, I want you to do a tour of the country. And I was, we were in the presidency of Europe. We had a million tons of beef. There was no intervention with a large exporter in the Northern Hemisphere of beef. Like it was, an, like, if you, if you weren't depressed, if you weren't panicking, you didn't understand the effing situation. So anyway, I just worked harder and, and I reached a point. I remember on the 23rd of October was my birthday. There was another IFA protest and I got them dollops of cash. And actually in private, they were very thankful to me and all the rest of it. And I, I just was at my ministerial desk and I couldn't write. I had a complete... Alistair Campbell, malfunction. And so, I, I, it's never happened to me before. So anyway, I went to a GP and they said, you're completely suffering from ner- nervous exhaustion, take a week off. And I went on a medication and so on. So I went to John and I said, John, look, I'm really not well. And uh, I'm chairing these meetings and, you know, I, I, I actually had some suicidal thoughts and, and so on. I was really and he actually turned around to me. This was absolutely one-to-one. And just to the humanity of the man, He said, would you believe it? He said, I had an instance like this when I was in finance and there was a European son of me and I actually thought I got a heart attack and I went to hospital and they did every cardiac check and I never had a heart attack and it was to do with nervous exhaustion. And he he said, anything I can do, he said, I'm sorry for sending you all over the country and anything I can do to help you. And he, he, he had great humanity. I like, and I, that will always be one of the things that, you know, you don't, can't make that up. That's not strategy, it's not tactic. It's either you're that type of loyal person or you're not. John Bruton, rest in peace. Let's talk about other things. You last week told me you wanted to talk about British politics. I just though, want to bring it onto this island briefly because for me, the photograph of the week, the most extraordinary photograph, I don't know if you saw it, from Stormont, was of Michelle O'Neill in a hug with little Rishi Sunak. It's an extraordinary photograph. They are embraced in a hug. What's wrong with that? Hold on a second. I'll tell you why that is actually completely shocking. I think that's good leadership. 
By her or by him? Oh, both. Right. Okay. I'll tell you why there's an issue with that, right? Well, first of all, I mean, I can only imagine how this went down in large sections of the North. I mean, there's one thing having good relationships between Sinn Féin and the British government, but a hug. Okay. Secondly, it's happened at a time when the British government, led by Sunak, are bringing in the legacy bill, right? Leo Varadkar, as our Taoiseach, is involved in a major standoff with Rishi Sunak to the extent that they apparently did not come face to face in Stormont. Now, this has been downplayed, but there's no doubt that there have been rows that have taken place. The Irish government is taking a legal action in relation to the British government's legacy bill, which is an attempt at a cover-up of British official collusion in terrorism in the north of Ireland. So when the Irish government is taking that position, for Michelle O'Neill to be hugging Rishi Sunak? Well, I think at the highest level in politics, personal relationships matter. I actually think you've got to have an eye to eye contact. You've got to find some connection. And the truth is, you are like ships in the night. Like, you know, you, a so handshake, just, Ivan. A handshake. Okay, okay. You have a situation. I, mean, I take that. Ma- Mary Lou MacDonald is looking on, smiling as well, as this hug takes place. She's in the photograph as well. And for all the people that Sinn Féin represents, let alone the Irish government's position, Trying to get to the truth of what the British state colluded in. Well, I, used to, I just think, I well, think this I was is in extraordinary. Brussels, when I was in Brussels, there was a guy called Franz Fischler, uh, who was Minister for Agriculture, and he had a 30 billion budget. I used to give him bear hugs because one of the things John Bruton was looking for was in Grange. Every month he'd say, what's happening about Grange? Some research brief, you know, uh, relocation thing from Brussels. And, and, and so, like, bear hugs and whatever you've got to do to find a connection with people who have power, who have money, and so on, I... I just understand it. You see, the other thing about Sunak is, my God, his government. I mean, Sunak is the guy who was beaten (laughs) to the uh, leadership of the Tory party by, I'm even nearly forgetting her name, your one Liz Truss. Yes. The 43-day premier. And then he sort of got the job by accident when she had to step down because she was an even bigger Egypt than people thought. Bigger Egypt, but she's back this week with this new thing, popular conservatism. And that uh, the the minister for the 19th century, Jacob Rees-Mogg, in beside her. And they're going on and they're banging on about how the Tory government of the last 14 years has been unable to do anything because they're held in the grip of the woke it is f- nonsense. That's a swear it is the word. nonsense. <laughs> it is the greatest nonsense. Okay. And this British politics has gone mad, and the Conservative Party has gone mad, and they are shagging up their own country royally, mm-hmm. which is not necessarily good news for us, albeit. The one upside of Brexit is I think it has actually helped with us getting further foreign direct investment because an awful lot of multinational firms looking at the mess things are in Britain have decided much better to be in stable Ireland with access to the EU rather than being in self-harming Britain. So the reason why I, I wanted to take a deep dive into British politics, A, I think there's a lot of synergies. First of all, in May 2010, David Cameron came into power and the, the like Fine Gael did in February 11. And basically, uh, they've been in power ever since. So is there a, an analogy between the two? And, and certainly when you look at... at you know, not only there are six factions now. Uh, you have not only PopCon playing their greatest hits, which was a budget that had unfunded forty nine billion of tax cuts, which was off the wall. Uh, but you have One Nation. Uh, you have the Common Sense Group, and so on. There are actually six factions, and overshadowing all this is Nigel Farage yeah, hanging and around the, like the Reform Party. Yeah, the ghost. At the banquet. So, so I I think there's a couple of deeper things here. First of all, we now know the scores on the door with Brexit. You've read a number of the economic reports and it is actually quite frightening in terms of uh, I'm, lo- I'm looking at Cambridge economics just some Ah, uh, you and your experts all these economic analysis Three experts. million less jobs Three million less <laughs> jobs than if they hadn't uh, gone with Brexit uh, 32% less investment 5% less exports and it's actually in terms of living standards 2,000 for every man woman that's and because they that's weren't. Pretty, that's because they weren't allowed to bring in the full Brexit that they wanted that they were stopped by the European Union and by all the wokists who are involved in the secret cabals and the British civil service so stop the popular government delivering what the people you see, want. You see this as a parody. I see this very serious. 30% of our trade is with the UK. Uh, the whole Northern Ireland situation. So, first fact, 
uh, Labour leading between 20 and 27 points. I think it's unbridgeable. Really interesting. In Scotland, you know, leave aside the whole Tory mess, 59 MPs. It now looks like the SNP is going to implode. If Labour gets 35 of those, they're actually, you know, they're, the, the swingometer yeah. that, 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 that those guys do in the BBC uh, goes right down. So I think uh, the, 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 the red wall that became a blue wall in Northern England, which was a Brexit thing, has also crumbled. So, first of all, what does a Keir Starmer government mean? Well, that's the interesting thing because he's almost conservative, shall we say, in the approach that he is taking. He doesn't want to rock any boats. He's very wary about making promises. I see even this week now, he's going to cut back on the committed spending for the green agenda. Again, it seems to be that he doesn't want to scare any potential shift of votes from the Conservatives over to Labour. Um won't yeah. rejoin the customs union thing really in the important. first term. No. In the second term, they might. But he's definitely going to have a new EU relationship between the UK. But the problem and, for him is, what sort of relationship will the EU want? Because is he the latest, he's going to be the latest sort of Brit coming along, looking for an a la carte relationship with Europe, only give us what we want. And they're going to turn around and say, well, looks, you made your choice. You decided to shag off. You're the ones who decided you want, didn't want to be in the single market, didn't want to be in the customs union. Europe is getting on with Without them. Now that said, uh, Europe isn't powering ahead economically. Germany is one of the most fascinating cases at present. What's happening in Germany probably deserves some the, of our attention. Yeah, yeah and, and there's a lot of political upheaval but, as well. Something we'll come back to but, at a later. But the stage. most, but most Britain, interesting yeah. thing to me about Britain is this. So we would have always thought about class politics, Labour, uh, and sorry, the biggest thing Keir Starmer has, he's, he's not Mr. Corbyn. Is not Jeffrey Cor- um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, and and so therefore, I'm really fascinated by some of the research that's been done into uh, uh, not class politics, middle class wealth, so on. And people say that you join the Conservative Party at the average age of 53, which tells you that people go on a journey. And you know what do they say? If you're not socialist in your 20s, um, you don't have a heart, and if you're not uh, uh, conservative in your 50s, you don't have a head, a brain. So I put it like this: I, I'm still trying to make up my mind where Matt Cooper fits on that index. I'm trying to think where you fit. <laughs> and they said, no, but, the, the, but the, 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 really look at the research. of pensioners voted for Boris Johnson. And it looks like in some of these new towns, if you look at the under 24s, the opposite, over 60% are voting Labour. And really what I'm saying is, and this is the mirror image of Ireland, on issues like we should get rid of all the objector culture, we should fast forward on planning, we should have vast areas of housing mass development, all the youngsters say, yes, yes, yes. And all the old people who are the Blue Rinse Brigade and the Antashka Brigade all say, no, 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 no. And and this is actually what's driving change in politics, both in the UK and Ireland, which is not a class divide, it's an age divide. But the other thing as well, I thought, which was very pointed this week, is a couple of instances of Sunak and the type of leader that he is. The Piers Morgan interview where they ended up doing a bet as to how many people he would manage to deport to Rwanda. I mean, that's but pretty But Piers crass. Morgan sort of manufactured that. What was he yeah, to do? No, I'm not going to have a bet. I'm not yeah, confident. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Right. Not that he's not confident. I think he all he had to say was, Piers, this is not the type of thing that you do betting on. We are talking about people's lives here. But he actually was just so weak that he blokely went along with it. Then there was also an incident in the House of Commons and there was a case of a trans teenager who was murdered and two people convicted last week for the murder and uh, their parents were in the Houses of Parliament and Sunak, rather than been able to actually have a comeback against the points that Starmer made in Leader's Questions, went into his usual reciting of so-called failings of Starmer and then made a joke, you don't even know what a woman is. The timing of that, even the British Mm. right-wing press, oh my God, this is actually sort of you don't do that at a time like this and not particularly when you have the parent in the well, gallery. Well, I actually this think guy Sunak, is crass. Oh, sorry. Okay, guy's crass. point taken. But I think Sunak is an improvement on Truss, who was yeah, the, the nadir of the low point. That's an improvement, uh, is an improvement on, on, on That's Boris. an improvement on a lettuce. It's probably not an improvement on, on, on Theresa May. But, like, the reality is... I, and that's why I think he'll go for a later election. He's worth over 700 million. Largely through his wife. 
Okay. And the word is he's going to California after his yeah. term as Prime Minister is over. So he's not one and, and there's no doubt when, when the Tories go into opposition, all these factions are going to have the mother and father of a row. Let's come uh, back to Ireland uh, because you said last week that you wanted to talk about Fianna Fáil. Why now talk about Fianna because, Fáil? Uh, because this. Okay, let me, let me just chart this for you. Uh, between 1932 and 2011, Fianna Fáil have been the largest party in the Dáil. OK, historically, perhaps the most significant party. And one can actually say with the Troika and the crash and everything that happened, to go to a low point of 17% of the vote in 2011 is understandable. But, I'm surprised they even got 17%. Yeah, OK. So now, we'll, we'll fast forward. Look, I'm sorry, there was recent in other countries. What was the, the party in Canada? Was it the National Party in the 90s got effectively wiped out, all but two seats, having been the biggest party in the country, when the people turned against them and decided we've had it, they were just wiped out? So, to the enormous credit of Michal Martin, he took over the party in the wilderness, a near-death experience, and he built it up in 2016 to 24%. In 2020, was projected to go higher, flatlined at 24%. My question to you is, they're in government, they have the most popular leader, 44% approved ratings, clearly of any party leader, and they are languishing in all polls between 15 and best case scenario, the latest poll, 20%. But they have actually been between 15 and 17 And I'm looking around, so what have they done wrong here? Uh, they have a popular leader. Why is this? And I actually have actually tried to, because I was thinking of this podcast and so on, I've actually done... I talked to a lot of people, senior journalists and uh, people in the party and outside the party. Why do you think that is? And people came up with really interesting answers. One, the common structure that was there back in the day of Bertie and so on has been replaced with one person, one vote. And there is no no local organisation. It's just uh, candidate. That's applied in a lot of parties. Secondly, there's a clear identity for Fine Gael. They want to cut taxes. Lido is a bit abrasive and so on. And Sinn Féin is a socialist Republican party. What is Fianna Fáil? Do they have a brand? And someone said to me, they've actually become a very boring party. And so therefore... Sorry, can I just cut yeah, across yeah, here? Because yeah. I think actually that may be, their caution is born out of still the scars are still there for the responsibility that they feel they bear for the economic crash. So that's partly why Michael McGrath is so cautious as Minister for Finance as well in not wanting to do things. But do you think Fianna Fáil is indistinguishable from the government brand? It possibly is, but I think they are just terrified of being accused of being reckless because if they feel that they're accused of being reckless, ah, the same old Fianna Fáil, that's when they will actually collapse entirely. Now, I wonder as well about the age profile of the 17 to 20 percent who are saying they're for them. How much of that is still an older audience, a bit like what you were talking about in the UK, the Tories, that these are and people... And maybe non-Dublin. Yeah, these are people who've always voted for Fianna Fáil and just can't bring themselves to vote for anybody else. But about how much of it is actually, how many much new blood? I know there are some younger TDs mm. there, but when it comes to actual voters... Is Fianna Fáil regarded as a 20th century brand? Yes, it pr- went into the 21st century and had a, a good success in the 2007 election under Bertie Hearn, and then everything imploded. And from there, I'm not sure it was ever going to be able to get out of the wreckage. And me, all Martin, Are you saying it's terminal? I, suspect- I don't. I, I think that wouldn't be great for Irish democracy. Like, I'm not saying this in anything other than trying to diagnose the problem. But can I just say Sir, this? You know, you say, are they indistinguishable from the government? I think it's pretty clear that, well, of course, they have options. They can either be in partnership with Fine Gael or they can be a junior partner to Sinn Féin in the next election. What That's a big decision for them to make. But the thing that's clear from either of those options is, is that they're not going to be the dominant player in a government in the foreseeable future. And once they're not seeing as being the movement that drives everything, then the rationale for people to become involved or to vote for Fianna Fáil has dissipated. And I suspect a younger generation, you know, there's a there's a sort of a meme that goes around in relation to it, that, you know, that they're, they've merged with Fine Gael at this stage. They're, they're indistinguishable. They're the two sides the of the same Because the total of Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil is now where, like, high point of Fine Gael was 76 seats yeah. in 2011. Fianna Fáil consistently under Bertie got close to 80 seats. And so therefore, the combined total, they give the right arm to get that next time between them. So they're two, they're two sides of the same coin, effectively, in, in essential terms. But the, it riddled me this. So my experience of politics, and we spoke about the leadership heaves in Fine Gael, is 
that if you look at Albert and Hohi, you look at Bertie and Albert, you look at Kenny and Leo, usually what happens is the young Turk has the numbers and goes to the old lion and says, you know, your time is up. And then a choreography develops that they retire. This hasn't happened. So Michal, uh, you know, it goes back to the Bertie era, multiple ministries. Uh, now, you know, a situation where he's led the party for nearly 14 years, uh, has done a lot, has been Taoiseach. He's 64. Like, there is nobody knocking on his no. door saying, I want your job. I- ironically, Does I that think... mean the party's moribund? Well, it, it raises Does questions. Does it mean its front bench is useless? Well, useless might be too strong a word, but... Is there anybody with the personality that the party thinks they could put on posters to help them win an election? And it doesn't look like there actually is anybody well, else. I'm saying the individual sorry, drive, yeah. I want to be Taoiseach. Well, it some, doesn't seem to be there. Well, you saw there were some people who did have it. Jim O'Callaghan seemed to have it, but... Dissipated? Yeah, but I mean, it was probably always likely okay. to be so. Miel Martin seems to be in some respects in a stronger position than he ever was as leader because remember there was a significant amount of his... Uh, backbenchers and indeed frontbenchers who didn't like his position on the 2018 abortion referendum. And he showed real leadership. And he showed incredible. And ever since then, and then even though he didn't get the votes that they wanted in the 2020 general election, he has been well regarded by most people as the Taoiseach and as leader of Fianna Fáil since, as reflected in this latest opinion poll, which has his popularity rate in the highest of any of the party leaders, way ahead of Mary Lou Macdonald as it happens as well. So that has given him a degree of strength. And I don't think anybody in, in Fianna Fáil can look at it and say, you know, if we had X, Y or Z as leader instead of Michal Martin, we'd do better. And I that, don't think they think that. That is the analysis. Can I ask you this? So he took a calculated gamble. He wanted the ministries of health and housing and education uh, because he wanted to have a programme. Has that worked for him? That's In other words, is it the case that people are saying, well, you built 33,000 houses, it's 50%, 30, you know, or more than, than previously. You've made some progress, but it's not enough and it's eaten bread. Do you actually think that's backfired on them? Well, it's a very interesting point. And you started, they will try and campaign on the basis we've built loads of houses and then the opposition will say you haven't built enough houses. To which I suspect Fianna Fáil will say, well, do you really believe that a Sinn Féin held the housing portfolio, that there would have been more houses built than we've built? And that's a question that people are going to have to answer for themselves when it comes to a vote is, do they really believe that Sinn Féin will build more houses? And sorry, something else which is relevant to Sinn Féin's perhaps difficulties in the polls in recent weeks and more people I've been talking to say that they believe that that the comments by Mary Lou Macdonald on housing and bringing down prices in Dublin has actually gone against the party, and that actually is something that is going to have to deal with. So, so I'm still predicting in the next all, Fianna Fáil will have more TDs than Fine Gael. I actually think, you know, there's a kind of a, a poll shy thing. People yeah. won't admit they're voting for Fianna Fáil. Okay, listen, we've probably gone a little bit longer than we usually do in this podcast because we spent correctly so much time talking about John Bruton. But I know there is one thing that you want to finish out with. You've been following the selection conventions with great interest for the European Parliament elections. Actually, we talk about branding. Isn't it remarkable how Barry Cowan has managed Given that Brian Cowan is so much blamed for the disaster of the government that was booted out ignominiously in 2011, but there you have Fianna Fáil putting forward as one of its European Mm. Parliament candidates, Barry Cowan, brother of Brian. I'll start with that. So there was a convention uh, on Monday night, the night of the bank holiday, and they had four voting centres, Sligo, Navin, Mullingar, and people could vote. And then they all went on to Mullingar to count the vote. And marginally, Blaney did much better than expected because he's been working three years on it. But Cowan won through. And the general perception is now it's a five seat and therefore the Cowan will get the seat. And they might actually add Blaney because Sligo, Le- uh, Leitrim and, and Donegal is a special area. But I, I think they're absolutely determined to do it and I think he will. But it was very interesting. I heard during the convention, you know the biggest issue because Lisa Chambers are the candidate. It was nothing to do with the merits of one candidate or the electability uh, to the parliament. Uh, and and what was the issue? The issue was, ah, headquarters is going to add Lisa Chambers, don't vote for her. Uh, oh, headquarters are going to add Brian Cowan, don't vote for him. It's amazing. And so... Wh- the, the old game is still carrying oh, to the 21st century. Oh, absolutely. just tells you how, you know what I mean, how jockeying for position, but really interesting is upcoming the Fine Gael Dublin uh, convention. So Francis Fitzgerald is retired and you have four people. You have Colin Brophy and you have Josepha Madigan. 
You have Noel Rock and you have Barry Ward in, in Dunleary. It will be really, this is really important for the party because the difference between getting it right, they'll select one, they might add one, but the point about it is selecting the wrong one and you might lose the seat is entirely. Is Regina Doherty not going for that? Well, put it like this. I, I, th- those are the four that I've heard. I'm not saying she's not, but th- th- put it like this. I, she could well be. Uh, but, and, and is Noel and, Rock really going to go for it? Is he not Oh, no, Rock is the one who's affairs? actually doing more beating the bushes than anyone else. But I, we'll talk about this again. But I, I really find it fascinating, uh, the kind of, you know, Jockeying for position, stab your mother in the eye to get what you want. That's the type of politics you love. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's I don't the, know, that's, I don't know why sorry, you, that's the real world. I don't know why you left it to go and make yourself rich. Okay, that is all we have time for in this week's Path to Power. From me, Matt Cooper. And me, Ivan Yates. And he got it right this week. Thank you very much for listening to us. Don't forget to subscribe, please. Uh, you can do that at Spotify or at Apple or wherever it is that you get your podcasts. And uh, please recommend us to a friend as well. We want to get the word out there that we're doing this. And if you do subscribe, it means that the podcast will drop for you automatically every week rather than you having to search for it. So until the next time, goodbye.